Welcome to Retro Programming on the Commodore 64, Episode 4. In this episode I want to talk about raster interrupts and how to play SID music in your own code. So let's get started. First let's have a quick talk about what are interrupts. Interrupts are basically triggers configured to execute a piece of code when a certain condition happens. In this case with raster interrupts it will be once the raster hits a specific line then the CPU will force a jump to the location we specified in our interrupt pointer. So why do we use interrupts? In the last episode I showed this little loop to wait for the raster to hit a specific line, so why not just use that instead of setting up an interrupt? Having the CPU sitting in a loop waiting for something to happen is a waste of CPU time. So with interrupts, instead of waiting for a condition to become true, the CPU is free to do other work in the meantime. So let's have a look at how we set up a raster interrupt. Here yeah, I'll prepare some code, and as always there's a link in the description to download all the code from this episode. So let's run through it and see what it does. It starts here, part of the initialization, so first thing we do is disable all interrupts. And then we disable the CIA timer interrupt, so it doesn't interfere with our raster interrupt. And then we start the raster interrupt setup. So first I clear the high bit in the raster line. That is because we do have more than 256 raster lines uh, down across the screen. So we set the high bit to zero. And then I say I want my interrupt to trigger on line 100. So as soon as the screen update raster reaches line 100, then we want it to trigger off and call my interrupt routine here. Now we see we got it down here, my interrupt. That's the code we want to execute once the raster hits line 100. And we do that by setting the interrupt pointer. So first the low byte, then the high byte of the address of my interrupt routine. So the 6510 processor is little engine, and that means the byte order is always least significant byte first. If you're not familiar with the term Indian, then it's got a bit of a funny origin. I believe it was in the book Gulliver's Travels, where the people were divided into two groups, little Indians and big Indians, depending on how they would eat a boiled egg. So either you eat it with the big end first or the little end first. So it's kind of interesting that ended up being a computer term. Anyway, next we enable the raster interrupt in the status register. And then we enable interrupts. So as soon as we do this, the first time the raster line will hit line 100, then it will jump to my interrupt. And the first thing we do in our interrupt routine, you have to do this, we have to acknowledge the raster interrupt. So we set the first bit to 1, and that will acknowledge the interrupt. If you don't do this, then it will just continue firing the interrupt. It will continue calling my interrupt, and you don't want that. Then we have our actual interrupt code, so I just put something in here. So we increase the value of our border color. And then we have a small delay here, and then we restore the border color to normal. And then it's a little bit interesting part, then we jump out to an existing kernel routine on address EA81. What it does is that it will restore the registers A, X and Y to the values they had before calling off to our interrupt routine, and the same with the CPU flags. So the reason we do that is because when we sit here in our main loop, and we might be doing some work here, maybe we are doing some calculations, or perhaps we're turning the player score into a string to print on the screen, or something like that. But this code can be broken at any point in time by the interrupt routine. As soon as it hits line 100, it will just force a jump to my interrupt routine. So that means this code here, for that to continue without crashing, we need to restore the values that were in the registers and the CPU flags. And that also means before jumping to my interrupt, it will save the values in the registers and the CPU flags. It's just going to put them on the stack. And once we're done, it will pop them off the stack and restore them. So that's really what all there is to it. 
So let's try run it and see what it looks like. There we go. So you can see here, this is line 100. Then we have our small delay and then we return here. So that means all the remaining CPU time is free for the CPU to do auto work. There's a very little overhead when we use a raster interrupt instead of waiting for the raster to hit a specific line. So that's basically it. However, most often you'll need more than one raster interrupt as in you need to trigger on more than one line. So how do we do that? I prepared another little example here. And the first setup is exactly the same as we had before. However, now we have two interrupts, my interrupt one and my interrupt two. So let's see what happens. First we set up my interrupt one and we do the same. It's gonna kick off on line 100. And initially it looks exactly the same. However, towards the end of the my interrupt one, so the next time it will jump off to my interrupt two. So here I've set it up for line 200 and then I change the pointer here to my interrupt two and then we return like we did before. Then once it reaches line 200 down here somewhere, it will call off to my interrupt two and we handle it exactly the same way. First we ignore the interrupt, then we do whatever we need to do in our interrupt. But then we need to start configuring it to jump back to my interrupt one the next time. So go down, we start updating the screen again, come line 100, then we want it to jump to my interrupt one. So we need to change the pointer again, and we need to change the raster trigger line number. So let's try run this and see what it looks like. So there we go. Now here we have on line 100 and down here again on line 200. And using this method, you can of course add as many interrupts here as you like. However, if we look at the code here, we can see there's a lot of duplicate code. All this is duplicated one time here, one time here, and one time in the initial setup. So of course we can do that a little bit easier. So when we have duplicate code, we should always think about either making it into a macro or creating a subroutine. So in this case, I think it makes best sense to make it into a macro. So let me just add one more example here. So through the magic of editing, I've added a new project file here and I've added a macro here, set up raster end. So it basically takes two parameters, the line you want the raster interrupt to trigger on and the pointer to the code you want to execute once you reach that line. Very simple. So let's see what the rest of the code looks like. So most of the initialization code has just been replaced by one call to our macro with 100 my interrupt one does exactly as it did before. And then we have my interrupt one. All the reinitialization code down here has just been replaced with a macro as well. Line 200, my interrupt 2, and the same in my interrupt 2 routine here. We point it back to my interrupt 1 at line 100. So let's try run it and see if it still works. And there we go. So it looks exactly the same. So I recommend you use this macro here. It will make your life a lot easier and it will make your code a lot cleaner. So you might ask, Okay, but why do I need all these raster interrupts? What are they actually good for? Is one interrupt not enough just to time my code so it only executes one time per screen refresh? Well, often you want to make some splits on your screen so you can do various effects. So I have a good example here. If we look at this game here, a very nice game, Wrath of the Demon. And here we have all this fancy parallax scrolling and for each of these parallax scrolling, where we scroll the screen, parts of the screen at different speeds, uh, you'll need to do a raster interrupt to reconfigure the scrolling for each section. And also here we can see the player character. It's very large, so it's made out of sprites. And it takes a lot of sprites to make a large character like that. And we only have eight sprites to work with. So clearly they're reusing the sprites on multiple lines and you can also do that with the raster interrupt so if you have a sprite one two three on top of the screen 
and then you make a raster interrupt and you can reuse sprite one two three lower down on the screen so there are really many reasons to use raster interrupts okay enough about raster interrupts let's move on to the second part of this episode how to play sit music the best source available for sit music files is the high voltage sit collection here you can download the whole collection with more than 50,000 SID music files from games, demo scene and individual releases. Chances are, if you ever heard a piece of music on the Commodore 64, it's going to be part of this collection here. And of course I will leave a link in the description, but you just click the downloads here, then you can get the complete archive, either 7-zip, zip or raw archive, choose which one you like the most and just download and extract the whole archive and then we're going to need a music player sit file player and we have this one sit play 2 for windows and you can download it here again i'll leave a link in the description some of the features of this player will allow us to get information from within the sit file that will help us when we need to load it into our own code and play it back because one thing that's important to understand about SID music files is that not really a standard and these SID files contain both player code and music data. Okay, let's try open a SID file in SID Play 2. I'll just go in here and say open. I've prepared a SID file here. And we can hear it plays back just fine, but that's not really what we want to use SID Play 2 for. What we really need is the properties here that provides us with a lot of information. It also tells us the name of the song, who released it. But the important data is really the load range. So it has to be loaded into memory on the Commodore 64 and address hex 4000. Otherwise it's not going to play. And the reason for that is because it includes the player code. So if you load it in at another address, all the absolute jumps and referencing memory addresses is going to be wrong and there are two more pieces of information one init address so we have to call off to dollar four thousand to initialize the music playback routine and then we have to call dollar four thousand and three to start the playback and we also get some more information like the sit model that was targeted and whether it was composed for pal or ntsc so that's going to determine how fast it's going to play back. So let's have a look at how we load a SID file and play it back in our own code. Here I've prepared another code sample file named SID play. So first let's have a look at how we load the SID file into memory. So from the information we got from the SID player, we know this file must be loaded into address $4,000. This will be different from each SID file depending on how the file will be exported from the tracker used to compose the music. And then I've added a label here, music player, just so it's easy to reference this memory location. And then we have the include statement here with the file name. And it's important to note the $7e as the second parameter here. This is used to strip off the sit header from the file. And we have to do this to make it work. So these statements here will load this sit file into memory. Now let's have a look how we initialize and call the playback routine. So I'm using a raster interrupt here because we have to call the playback code each screen update. So most of the code you see here is exactly the same as what I covered earlier. What we have different a little bit here is the initialization. So here I'm calling off to the music player label. So that's $4,000. That was the information we got from the SID player. And as a precaution, I set the registers a, X, and Y to zero, uh, because sometimes the SID music files will contain more than one tune, and then you will use one of these registers here to select what tune you want to play back. However, in this case with the SID file I've chosen, it only contains one tune. And then we go down in our interrupt routine. Well, you see, it looks exactly the same as before, except we call off to the music player plus three, so dollar four thousand and three for the music playback routine. And we do that once every screen update. That's it. So let's see how it runs. There we go. So it's playing back nicely. 
I can kind of get an idea here how much CPU is using. It's not too bad. It's looking pretty good. Once you start including some zip files in your own code, you'll quickly find that it would be very nice if you could move them to a different memory location. Plus, you'll find that some zip files require bank switching because they're loading in on top of system memory. Fortunately, there's a tool available called SidRelog that does exactly this. I've included a link in the description. This is the homepage for the tool. This mostly goes through how it works, what it does, and some about how to use it. And then we have another page here where we can download the tool. So there's a download link to a Windows version here. So I'll include the link in the description. So the SidRelog tool is a command line tool. You can try to open it up here. And if we just type SidRelog, it will show us all the parameters we have to play with. But really, the only parameters you really need, or the easiest way to do it, is just to do SidRelog. Then you need to specify page. So let's say we want to relocate the SID file I used previously. We just want to relocate it to $2000 in memory. So I'll just put in the details. Let's call it Laser20. Like this. And that should relocate it from $4,000 in memory to $2,000. So let's try to run it. It's running. However, we see here, we got some errors. So it says too many bad pitches, mismatching pitches. However, in a case like this, we can try to force it and see if sometimes it still works. So this tool does not always work. But we can try force it and see if it still works. So we just add a dash F, then I will force it to do the relocation, and then we can see if the music is okay or not. All right, now we say it's successful. So let's try to load the new version into our code in $2000 instead of $4000. So I'll just update the code here with our new relocated SID file. We load into $2000 and change the file name here. Okay, that's it. So let's try run it and see if it still works. Yeah, that still sounds good. So it looks like the relocation was successful. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And you'll have to play around. And so as you saw, there were a lot more parameters on the SID relock tool. So using some of these parameters can help. And usually you can make it work. Anyway, I think that's it for this episode. Now you should be able to do raster and chops and play back SID music files in your own code. If you have any questions or issues, just leave a comment. I hope you enjoyed the episode and found it useful. So don't forget to subscribe for more content. And thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye bye.